Well, we are in the middle of a series called Reformation 500 that's really uh, celebrating and honoring the 500-year anniversary of an event that happened October 31, 1517, this Augustinian monk, monk Martin Luther, nails these 95 ideas speaking about the abuses of the church that he loved, and he nailed them to the, the, the door of the church there in Wittenberg, Germany, where he lived. He was hoping to start this discussion to address these abuses and reform the church that he loved, but rather than reform it, he ended up causing the seismic shift in, in the history of the world, one that is still impacting us deeply to this day. I mean, more than just um, split Christianity in two between Catholic and Protestant and, and, and start these two main branches. It, it, it's impacted the way we think, the way we live, again, in more ways than we realize. And so for this, this month of November, we've been really focusing in on these five main tenets of, of what made the Reformation the Reformation, these five beliefs that really sought to get Christianity back to its foundation, things that have been lost sight of over hundreds of years of abuse and corruption in the church. And each of these five tenets start with this Latin word, sola. The word that means only or alone, the word from which we get the word solo, when someone stands up and sings or plays an instrument all by themselves. And we've covered some of them already. We've looked at sola scriptura, that the, the, the Reformation of Christianity is based on the Bible alone as our highest authority. A couple weeks ago, we looked at sola gratia and sola fide, that we are saved from our sin by grace alone through faith alone. Next week, Pastor Edwin's going to lead us through soli deo gloria, which means that we live and we are saved all for the glory of God. But today we're going to get to the one right in the middle, the one that kind of holds them all together. And all of these five solas, they all interact and they're all related and some, there's overlap. But right at the center, the one that, the glue that holds it all together is this controversial idea that was controversial in 1517, but is even more controversial today. And that is solas Christos, that we are saved in Christ alone. Now, this idea of solus Christus has two main um, tenets or, or branches or ideas or beliefs that come with it. Number one, uh, who Jesus is, that he is fully God and fully humanity, completely unique in his being. And number two, that we are saved completely by his work. His work to save us is completely sufficient to save sinners. So this was a, a radical idea in 1517, but you would think, well, why would that be radical? We're talking about the church. Why would the church need to be reminded that Jesus is like everything, that Jesus is the center of salvation. Well, the church of 1517 believed that Jesus was essential to salvation and that his work on the cross to save us was very important. It just wasn't enough. That you needed to add to what Jesus did in order to be saved. And particularly what you needed to do is the church needed to uh, apply that salvation to each individual sinner so that they could be saved. So really, what we're talking about in 1517 was a theology that we could call Jesus plus. Jesus plus blank. Add whatever you want to Jesus, but Jesus and his work to save us needs a little bit of help. So maybe it's Jesus plus Mary, right? Mary is really the mediator of grace, so we pray to Mary because God and Jesus, they're kind of stern. So if we go to their mom, well, then the mom could talk to God and then, then she'll talk to them and We'll, we'll get what we need. So maybe we got to go to Mary, or maybe it's Jesus plus good works. And a couple weeks ago, we talked about the good works of the saints that were stored up in this treasure chest of merits. And so we, maybe we need that as well as Jesus' works, or my own good works, right? I need to be good. I need to go to church. I need to, you know, do the things that good Christians do in order to add to the work of Jesus. Or maybe Jesus plus penance or the other sacraments of the church. If I sinned, I'd go to confession. The priest would tell me what to do to work off my sins. I would say this many prayers, and therefore I'm helping Jesus save me through the penance. Or when all else fails, it could be Jesus plus purgatory, right? Anything, any sin that Jesus didn't pay for and I didn't work off in this life, I could work off in this place of torture over thousands of years before I get to heaven in order to kind of help save myself. And this is the Christianity that Martin Luther was raised in, and it's what he was trained in. And again, as we talked about two weeks ago, no one ever worked the system of Jesus plus like Martin Luther. If it's Jesus plus Mary, he's going to pray to Mary. And many times he said, I'm, I'm, I'm calling out to the saints for help, St. Anna or Mary or whoever it would be. And if it's Jesus plus good works, I'm going to do the most works of anybody else because he was an overachiever. He was a performer. And so he worked hard to, to live the cleanest, the best, the purest life of any monk ever. Or if it's Jesus plus the sacraments of the church and penance, he was going to do it times 
too. I mean, Martin Luther was going to go above and beyond to make sure that he was working the system of Jesus plus. But as he began to get into the Bible and study the Bible, as he studied for his doctorate of theology, he began to see that the Bible from cover to cover is all about Jesus. It's all about being saved by Jesus. From the very first pages of Genesis, chapter 3, after the, the first sin of Adam and Eve, after we had given the world over to death and kicked God out of his own creation, he reads about God promising the fact that a Savior would come. And then God himself does the first animal sacrifice so that he can clothe Adam and Eve and cover their sin in, in the hide of an animal. And then for the next several thousand years, as you read the New Testament, every animal sacrifice was pointing forward to the Savior who would come, who would redeem us from our sins. And prophets came along. Prophets like Moses in the book of Exodus talked about another teacher, another prophet who would come who's even greater than Moses. And you have prophets like Isaiah who prophesied this Messiah who would come and what he would be like, that he would be this wonderful counselor, this almighty Savior, a wonderful God. And then you have Daniel saying exactly when he would come, when the Savior would be born. And Micah saying uh, where he would be born, in Bethlehem. And then, of course, we get to the New Testament. It's all about Jesus and how he saved us. The forerunner, John the Baptist, points to him and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Every one of the epistles after the Gospels is talking about the work of Christ and how it saves us from sin. And, of course, the Gospels talk about Jesus, the one who was born, God in a manger, the one who lived the perfect life, the one who took our sins upon him, the one who went to the cross, the one who was resurrected, the one who ascended back to heaven, the one who is coming again, Jesus is the source of our salvation, solos Christos. And as the reformers began to understand this, it led them to a freedom that changed the world, turned the world upside down. They realized the implications of solos Christos, that we don't need to go to Mary or the saints. We can go directly to Jesus. We have access to Jesus all on our own. That while good works are important, they're not necessary for our salvation because Jesus has already done all the works necessary of righteousness to save me, and he credits those to my account. That I don't have to go to purgatory, hallelujah, because Jesus has already paid for all of my sins. And even the sacraments of the church, sacraments like baptism and the Lord's Supper, while they're important, they're not necessary for salvation. They're simply demonstrations of the saving faith that Christ has already given me. So is Christos. It set the world on fire. It changed the way we view God. And, and as much as they needed it in 1517 to hear these truths about Christ only saving us, we need to come back to this truth again even more so, even more so in our culture today. It is more radical today than it was in 1517 because the two main tenets of solus Christos are under attack in our culture right now. You think of the first tenet of Christianity, of solus Christos, that Jesus is completely unique, that he is fully God and fully man. And ask anyone if, if Jesus is God in our culture, and most will say, well, he was a great teacher. He was a rabbi with some good sayings, great leader, great religious leader, political leader. But he's not God. That's taking it too far. Or if you ask, well, is Christ alone sufficient to save me? You say, well, I mean, certainly he has a part to play, but you can't say it's him alone. I mean, every way leads to God in our culture of pluralism. A word like only or alone is not tolerated because it seems intolerant. Any way is tolerated other than the one that says this way only. But we claim today, solos Christos, because this is what Jesus claimed, that he is the only way. And we could look at many places in his teachings where he said that he was God and that he was the way of salvation. But no place is more clear, I believe, and no place is more blunt than in John chapter 14. In John chapter 14, we read John recording the events of Jesus right the night before he was crucified. He's spending one final evening with his disciples. They're having the last meal. He's pouring into them for one final time. And he begins to tell them that he's going away. And he uses his father's house with, with many rooms as a, a metaphor for heaven. And he's saying, you know, I'm going there, but you're going to be able to go there too. And all this talk about going away in heaven and them going to raises these questions in the minds of the disciples, questions that they asked and that Jesus would answer. And the two questions they primarily wanted to know in John 14 as a result of what Jesus was saying were the two vital, essential questions all of us have to ask. Who are you? And how do we get where you're going? 
Let's look at John chapter 14, beginning at verse 4. Again, Jesus has been talking about his father's house, heaven. He's going there. They can go there too. And it begins in verse 4 by saying, you know the way to the place where I'm going. I'm going away. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to my father's house. There's many rooms there. You're going to be able to come to. And you know how to get there. And then Thomas, fortunately Thomas, speaks for the rest of them because they're all like, uh, we don't know where you're going. How can we possibly know how to get there? And so he asked them, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? We don't know where heaven is. We don't know where your father's house is. We've never seen it. We've never seen a road sign or a, a map of how to get there. And so Jesus tells them very plainly, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, and I kind of doubt that you do, sounds like, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So Jesus right there answers the question, how do I get there? We'll come back to that. But then the next question comes from Philip. He's got a, a, a good question too. He says, well, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. In other words, this is a question of identity. Who are you? And who is the Father? And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time? I mean, three and a half years we've walked together, Philip. You, you don't have this figured out yet? The night before I'm going to die? Jesus goes on to say, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves, the works that I have performed. So again, here in this interchange between Jesus and his disciples, particularly Thomas and Philip, we have these two big questions being asked. The first question is, again, who are you, Jesus? And Jesus makes it really clear to answer Philip's question that me and the Father, the Father and I, we are one. That I am God, and the Father is God, and we're both God. That if you want to know what God looks like, the Father looks like, just look at me. You want to know what the Father thinks about uh, sin or sinners, Watch how I interact with sin and sinners. If you want to know how they, that the Father God feels about sickness or death, watch how I interact with those who are sick and those who have died. If you want to know how the Father feels about those who are on the outside of faith, have you seen how I've been interacting with people? That is exactly how the Father would act. We are one. And then Jesus, he ends it by saying, if you don't believe me, at least believe on the evidence that I have given you over the last three and a half years. They've walked with him for three and a half years. And he's, he's saying to them, think about all the things you've seen me do. Remember that night that I, I walked on the water? Like you were in the middle of the lake and I, I walked out to you the time that we were at the wedding and I changed the water into the wine. A couple times when we didn't have anything to eat, nobody had anything to eat, and I made bread and fish out of nothing and fed thousands. That happened like twice. Remember that? Remember all the lepers that I touched and were healed? The, the crippled people, that, the people that couldn't walk? Paraplegics? that I spoke into and they got up and walked. Do you remember the time that we were like in the storm and you guys were so afraid and I spoke a word, peace be still, and the storm stopped? Do you remember that? Or how about the time when we were at the grave of Lazarus? He had been dead for four days and I said, Lazarus, come out, and he like woke up? Or at the biggest of all of the miracles that Jesus worked, that he predicted his own death and his resurrection and then he pulled it off. Jesus is saying, look at the evidence I am who I say I am. Don't be confused. The Father and I are one. And because the Father and Jesus are one, Jesus is completely and utterly unique. There has never been another being in the universe like Jesus, who is fully God and fully man. And that's good news for us because we needed someone completely unique to save us. A human couldn't save us. We needed someone to come who was as holy as God, but that could take our sins on us. So that in Jesus' death for us, the, completely, the death of this completely unique being, God could be simultaneously merciful and just. That he could set sinners free while also upholding the holiness of his law. Who is he? Solus Christos tell us that he is absolutely unique. He is God and he is man. But the next question that they ask is, well, how can we be saved? How do we get to where you're going? 
How do we get to the Father's house? Yeah, we hear you talking about the Father's house. There's many rooms, and we can go there, and we know the way. But Jesus, we don't know the way. How do we get there? And Jesus answers them, I am the way and the truth and the life. And for someone who likes directions and formulas, this is kind of frustrating. Because Jesus doesn't give a formula. He doesn't say, well, you know, go down this road and then jump up really high and hope that you can get to heaven and then fall into this star. He doesn't give a formula for how to live or five, like, directions for, you know, how to get to heaven. He simply says, if you know me, you know how to get there. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. What he's saying to them is you don't need the formula. You don't need the directions. You don't need the roadmap because I'm going to come back myself. I'm going to take you by the hand and I'm going to lead you there myself. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And we like that part. That, that part's really good. I'm really, I'm like, yes, yes. It's what he says next that starts to border on offensive because he says this, no one comes to the Father except through me. And we're like, whoa, time out. Yikes. It sounds like he's saying he is the only way to heaven. And in our culture, even within the church, to say that one way is the only way is highly offensive. And that's because we have all been affected in varying degrees by relativism. Right? Relativism is the belief that all truth is relative. I have my truth, you have your truth. What works for me works for me. What works for you works for you. But don't tell me what works for you needs to work for me because that's offensive, right? We could both have our own truths, even though they contradict, as long as they're working for us. This is relativism. And in a culture of relativism, someone coming along and saying, I am the only way to the Father, borders on arrogance, even if you are God's son. And let me just say, if you're here today as a uh, someone who would maybe consider yourself a Christian, maybe you haven't made a decision for Christ yet, you're just kind of exploring these things, this may be one of the very things that you'd say, that's the reason I'm not a Christian. I've heard Christians talk about this. I've heard the saying of Jesus, it just seems so narrow-minded to me that anyone would say such a thing. I mean, it seems, I, I, I could never follow a God who would be so arrogant or narrow-minded as to just completely um, pay no attention to all the other paths and all the other religions, all the other people who are, you know, trying to do their best in honoring God. And let me just say, I get it. I, I get it. I, too, have been influenced by relativism. And there are a lot of Christians who wish they could go in because they've been influenced by relativism and, and just cross certain things out or white out or scissors or eraser or whatever. Jesus, did you have to say it like that? Did you, I mean, could, can we soften that up just a little bit? You know, wouldn't it be nice if all paths did lead to the same place? Wouldn't it be nice if all religions actually did end in God and heaven and in the end everyone is right and everyone is happy? But that would undermine human intelligence as well as the spirit of freedom of choice. I've heard it explained like this. It's like we all have our own favorite color, but in the end we find out all of our favorite color really is blue. All roads lead to blue. You know, no, I like orange. I really like orange, and I want to like orange. No, in the end, you will like blue. <laughs> or we all have a favorite food, right? Maybe your favorite food is Mexican or Thai or Italian. But in the end, we find out that all of our favorite food really is, of course, Indian. <laughs> no, I really like Italian. No, you like Indian. You see... Um, Jesus said that I am the only way to the Father because he is the only one who's come to rescue us. Because he's the only one who can come to rescue us. Because he's the only one who is God. He's saying, I am the only one who can do it. I am the only one who has done it. I am the only one who will do it. You know, Muhammad can't do it. Muhammad is a man. Uh, Buddha can't do it. Buddha was a man. We know where his grave is. You know, Shiva or Krishna, they can't do it. Dr. Phil, Oprah, they can't save you. They're, they're humans. But because I am uniquely God and I have come to save you, therefore I am the only one who is coming and you are only going to get to the Father through me. This is just the reality of things. Solus Christos, Christ alone has come to save us. 
And as much as they needed to hear it in 1517, as much as it turned the world upside down and set people free, that they didn't have to do all these other things, they could just turn to Christ. Again, we need to hear this more in our culture than ever before because we have these huge, monumental obstacles to overcome in our culture to get to this Reformation belief of Solus Christus. Let me share just three obstacles that we need to overcome in our culture to get to the truth of Solus Christus. And the first is, who needs Jesus? This is a cultural obstacle that many of us have to face because we really believe that we don't need a Savior. You know, I'm a pretty good guy. I've lived a pretty good life. I've made some mistakes, sure, but I'm not an axe murderer. You know, I'm not a child abuser. In the end, I'm going to, you know, work things out with God. God's going to accept me the way I am, and it's all good. Who needs Jesus? I don't need someone to die for my sins. It's not that bad. It's kind of like Peter the night before Jesus died, the night that Jesus was saying all these things in John 14. Peter, or Jesus went to Peter and said, hey, Peter, you're like my best friend. Things are going to get really bad tonight. It's going to get really scary, and the world's going to turn upside down. And I just want to warn you, you're going to deny even knowing me three times. And Peter, like, rebukes Jesus, and he says, you underestimate me, Lord. I am with you. I will never deny knowing you. I will never betray you. I will never run out on you. But Peter was overestimating himself. Because before the, the, the rooster crowed the next morning, things had gotten so crazy that Peter had denied even knowing Jesus out of fear three times. And he came to this place where he realized the total depravity of his heart. It had been there all along. He just didn't see it. But he came to the place where he wept bitterly and he realized he needed a Savior. He needed to be saved by Christ alone. And all of us are at like one of two places, right? We're either at that pre-denial stage of Peter's life where we're like, I got this. Yeah, I made a couple mistakes, but I can handle it. But many of us have already come to those moments where, like Peter, we realize the depravity of our hearts and how much darkness there is in us and how much we need a Savior. We do need a Savior, but we need to overcome this cultural obstacle that says, no, oh, we're okay on our own. But a second cultural obstacle we need to overcome is this obstacle of Jesus as one of many. And again, this comes back to this relativism we've already talked about, that you know, Jesus, yeah, he's one way and he works for some people, but there are other ways to get to God, other religions and other paths. They all lead to the same place. This is one of many. This is, comes to the relativism that says that any way is valid as long as it doesn't claim exclusivity. Because if you claim exclusivity, then you're being arrogant and narrow-minded, and, and it's just intolerant. But Jesus said he is the only way, because again, he is the only way. He is the only one who has come to rescue us. He's our only way off this planet. Just invite you to imagine that somehow, someway, you have ended up stranded at sea, and there you are floating in the middle of the ocean. You've got a life vest, and that's it, no supplies, and you realize... You, you need to get out of there. And so you're swimming with all your might. You're swimming, swimming, swimming. You swim till you're exhausted. And you still see nothing but water. You realize you can't swim out of this mess. And then the sharks come. And the sharks are swimming around you. And they're starting to bump into you. And you realize that if you don't get out of this soon, you are toast. You need saving. And all of a sudden, you hear this distant sound. And it's beautiful. It's the sound of a helicopter. And it's coming closer and closer. And soon, this Coast Guard helicopter is hovering over you, and the door opens, and a man throws out a, a, a rope with a chair-like thing on the bottom, and he swings it down to you, and he tells you, get in the chair, we've come to rescue you. I mean, can you imagine the curiosity in that man's face if you'd say, what are my other options? <laughs> what are your other options? Are you kidding me? Nobody else is coming to save you. We're the only ones who have come to rescue you. How would that man feel if you'd say, that's quite arrogant of you. To say that you are the only one who's coming to rescue. I believe that all paths lead me back to safety. Jesus is the only one who has come. He's the only one that can come. And I know this raises the question in our minds, well, what about all the people who have never heard the name of Jesus? What about all those people? Multitudes of people, billions of people who have lived who have never heard the name of Jesus. What about them? Can they be saved? And, and again, I get that too. I get the question. I understand the concern that we have. What we really want to know is, is God as compassionate as I am? Because I care about those people who never heard about Jesus, and I want them to be saved. And the answer is yes, 
Jesus is just as compassionate as we are, even more so, because we sit here in the comfort of Douglas County wondering about those people when Jesus left heaven to come and save those people so that every person could be in the kingdom of God and that every person who will be there will be there because of Jesus. Whether they've ever heard his name or not, we can't understand how that works or how God will judge people. We do believe, though, that there will be some people in heaven who have never heard the name of Jesus but will hear for the first time when they're in his kingdom. And they will know, too, that they are there because this God came as a rescuer and that they are saved through Solus Christos. One final hurdle we need to overcome. It's the same hurdle that Martin Luther had to overcome, the church of 1517 had to overcome. It is the hurdle of Jesus Plus. And this one is really close to home. If you've been in church for a while, you feel yourself somewhat religious, yeah, I trust Jesus. He just needs a little help. I got to add a little bit to the work that he's done to make sure that I am really saved. And so we add any number of things to Jesus to feel a little bit more confident in our standing with God. And so maybe we add, like when we sin, we feel like we have to feel really, really sorry about our sin and just beat ourselves up because we're saved with, by Jesus plus you know, remorse. Or maybe I just need to love God even more. I, I have to have this feeling of love for God because I'm saved by Jesus plus love for God. Or we have to be really good and we have to do the right things and not get on God's bad side because we're saved by Jesus plus good works. Or add any number of things that we ask, start to add to Jesus that I'm saved because of my belief or I have all the right doctrines. Saved by Jesus plus doctrine. I'm saved by Jesus plus the right Bible translation. I got the right Bible translation, therefore me and God are good. There are any number of things that we could add to Jesus to make ourselves feel more secure in our salvation. Jesus plus my American citizenship. Jesus plus the Republican Party and conservative politics. Jesus plus the Democratic Party and liberal politics. Jesus plus marketing and church growth. Jesus plus you know, traditional values. Jesus plus the right Bible translation. Jesus plus you know, the right understanding of end time events. We can add so many things to Jesus that we create a religion of our own that gets by just fine without Jesus. Anytime I add anything to the work of Christ, I take away from the work of Christ. I am saved by solos Christos, the work of Christ alone. And this is so important because anytime I, I try to add anything, to what Jesus has done, I am demonstrating a lack of faith. I'm saying, God, I don't trust you, and the work that you've done is enough. Therefore, I need to add to it. And the one thing Jesus demands is faith. The one thing he asks for is that we trust him, that we lean into him, that we believe him. Solus Christos. We need to get back to this Reformation idea that it is Christ alone who is totally unique and that it is his work alone that saves us. It's just Jesus. Because it was just Jesus who left heaven and came to earth as an embryo in the womb of a teenager. It was just Jesus who 2,000 years ago was born to that teenager that night in Bethlehem that we'll be celebrating in about a month. It was just Jesus who grew up and lived this perfect life before God, storing up all the righteousness we would need to be saved. It was just Jesus that showed us what God is really like. It was just Jesus who went to the Garden of Gethsemane and threw all of our sin and all of our shame on his back. It was just Jesus who went to trial, who was flogged, who was beaten, who was falsely accused. It was just Jesus who climbed the hill to Calvary and was nailed onto a cross. It was just Jesus who felt the abandonment of his father as he hung there, as the Holy Father had to separate from his sin-laden son. It was just Jesus who breathed his last and cried out, it is finished. The work is done. It is just Jesus who went to the tomb. It is just Jesus who rose again three days later. It is just Jesus who ascended back to the Father and is now on one of our own team, a human in the Trinity, representing us before the Father. It is just Jesus who is coming again to take us by the hand and say, I told you I would come back I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know, I just find it so encouraging that the group of men that Jesus 
was talking to that night. Think about what was going on in that room and what he encountered in that room. The guys that he said, let not your hearts be troubled. I'm, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm coming again to take you there. The guys he said that to were clueless. They didn't fully believe. They didn't know who he was. They didn't know what was going on. Jesus even said to them, if you really knew me, in other words, you didn't, you don't really know me. But yet it's to th these guys, these unbelievers in the room with him, that Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Trust God. Trust me. I've got this. He was speaking as though it was all up to him. Because it was all up to him. And if you don't find encouragement in that, think about what happened the next day with a thief being crucified next to him, a guy who had lived a, a morally depraved life, who was being crucified, executed for his crime. And as he hangs next to Jesus, he sees in Jesus something, and he's, he's drawn to something in Jesus, and he says to him, I believe you. Can I be with you in paradise? And here's this man whose wrists are nailed to the cross, so he can't do anything for Jesus. His feet are nailed to the cross, so he can't go run errands for Jesus. He doesn't have the right belief system. He doesn't know who Jesus was. He can't explain end time events. He doesn't know what Bible translation to, to read. He's not moral. He's lived a depraved life. Yet he sees something in Jesus that can save him. And so he asks the question, can I be with you in your kingdom? And Jesus looks at him and says, this guy's got faith. Therefore, I assure you, you will be with me in paradise. He wasn't saved by his works. He wasn't saved by his knowledge. He wasn't saved by his beliefs. He wasn't saved by his morality. He was saved by his faith. And if you have any struggle with this <coughs> Reformation doctrine, just put yourself on the cross with that thief and realize that your hands are nailed and your feet are nailed and that you and I have lived depraved lives and we don't have all the right beliefs and we don't know which Bible translation is the best. But if we just lean into him, he's got it. Amen. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to your cross I cling. Mm -hmm. Solos Christos. We are saved by Christ alone. Amen. Let's thank him for that. Father in heaven, thank you that while we were in the middle of the ocean and we couldn't paddle our way or swim our way out, you sent the rescue team to pluck us out of the water. May we lean into you. Regardless of where we are in our faith journey, whether we have been walking with you for decades or maybe in church for the very first time, May your spirit convict us now that Jesus is God and that he is sufficient to save. And may we receive him in this moment and receive the freedom that those reformers experienced 500 years ago. And may our culture be turned upside down the same way theirs was, theirs was because of this amazing truth of who you are and what you've done. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.